I'm going to give an overview to hopefully motivate um, an interest in this sort of new planets. Um, these are the planets that I work on, um, and they have a name that needs to be explained, first of all, because super-Earth tends to give you an imagery of being Earth in bigger size, but it doesn't mean that it ha they have the same characteristics. So far, um, they have, they, we've discovered more than 700 extrasolar planets. These are planets orbiting other stars. Most of them are giant planets like Jupiter. But because of the interest in discovering Earth analogs and the technology advancements, now they're discovering planets that are much smaller in sizes, which means they are different in composition, probably more like the Earth. So for the ones that we have masses and radius measured, I'm showing them here. You can see, uh, in com I've also plotted the solar system planets for comparison. You can see that most of them are these Jupiter-like planets that are mostly made of hydrogen and helium. But now we're starting to tap into this regime, the so-called super-Earths, with masses between 1 and about 10 times the mass of the Earth. It's not a hard threshold because it's inspired on physics, meaning that uh, when you form a planet and it forms more than a 10 Earth mass rocky core, it can quickly accrete uh, an atmosphere as big as Jupiter. So, but this 10 Earth mass core actually is model dependent. So even though it's based on something physical, the, it could be 8, it could be 13, we don't know. And hopefully those are the type of things that we're going to be able to answer as more data comes around and we can ask, uh, are these actually planets that are scale-up versions of Earth or are they downsized versions of Neptune? So some of the reasons why they're very interesting is because they are this new class of planets for which we know very little about. There's no such planet in the solar system. They can bridge our understanding of the Jovian planets and the terrestrial planets. And because they're this new lab, uh, we can test ideas and physical ideas that have been developed for our, our local planets. Also, there's very, um, to, to motivate more the discussion uh, that this is uh, not science fiction, we've already discovered, or astronomers have already discovered, planets that are even the size of Earth or even smaller. For these planets, actually, there is no mass measurement, so it's hard to tell exactly what the composition is, but based on their small size, we think that they are similar to Earth or Venus in composition. So, what are the things that we want to know about these planets? We want to know, obviously, as much as we possibly can, but one of the one of the main goals is to answer if they are habitable. And for that, we need to answer a lot of other questions first. Um, so that's, that's our, our main goal. But the first thing we want to know is what they're made of. Are they, as I said, something closer to, to Neptune? Or are they something closer to Mars or Mercury? Um, how do they form? Do they form in the same way? Um, than the terrestrial planets did just by accreting, or are they actually, as I said, Neptune, and then they got rid of their of their more massive envelopes? How do they evolve? And I'll touch. This is what I'm going to discuss the most today because it touches on habitability closely. Uh, what is their atmosphere like? And all of these all of these questions are related to each other. And first. Uh, we're going to emulate what's been done for the exo-Jupiters. We're going to discuss first single planets and then see what the trends, what are the trends we see in populations. So as I said, I'm going to discuss most uh, evolution. And I'm going to present to you the data. And this is the discouraging part because it's very, very limited. Um, especially when I'm talking to an audience like you because you're used to Earth sciences where you can measure things in the lab. Um, this is, this is gonna sound like we cannot learn much about, but you, you can. That's, hopefully I can convince you of that. Um, so we, there are two very successful methods of discovering these planets that gives us certain data. So the first one is the radial velocity method, by which neither of the methods actually, um, directly detect the planet. You see the indirect effect on the star. So in this one, you exploit the fact that the planet tugs and pulls the, the star uh, due to gravity so that the star uh, moves away from you and towards you so that when you take the spectrum, you see this wobble. And the, the, this, the, the strength of this wobble depends on how massive the planet is. 
um, but it's actually how massive the planet is projected onto the line of sight. So it, it, it only gives you a minimum mass. In the case where planets actually pass in front of the star, you see a dip in luminosity that depends on the ratio of uh, sizes. So you can also get the radius of the planet. And actually, you can get the configuration with... So planets that are transiting, um, you can get both the mass and the radius. If, actually, if you have the precision to get the mass. Um, because one of the downsides of Kepler, um, and that's why I was nodding my head when Paul said, oh, we this Earth-like planet, is that... There are a lot of radius measurements for these planets, and they're actually called candidates, but we don't have a lot of masses. And if we don't have a mass, um, we are not sure it's a planet. It most likely is, but we are not sure. Um, another piece of data that's very important that Paul alluded to is that we're going to get some information on the atmosphere for the planets that are transiting. So the planets that are transiting and passing in front of the star, the light that's coming from the, from the star will pick up a signal uh, from the rays that actually go through the very, very up, upper atmosphere, and you can see that in the, in the spectra um, of the combined system. And then also when the planet goes behind the star in the secondary transit, actually you can detect um, the um, thermally emitted radiation because the, the star will actually, some of, some of the light will, will reflect back from the planet, and some of the light will actually come from the, from the, um, intrinsic luminosity of, of, of the object. And also, actually, as uh, the planet moves around, you can see a modulation in the phase curve. You'll see a modulation here that tells you something about the atmospheric dynamics um, of the planet. So uh, transit planets are very interesting because we can get more information. In particular, um, I'm interested in the composition because for the framework of the small planets, actually, that's very tied to the interior. For the larger planets, the atmosphere, the envelope, it's primordial. It acquired it when it was during, uh, forming. But for the for, for our planets, as you know, we have a secondary atmosphere that was created through outgassing, uh, volcanism, and so on. Uh, so uh, this is one of the planets for which we have this spectra. It's uh, one of the smaller planets. It's very exciting because it's only... Um, I believe it's seven times the mass of the Earth, even though it's much larger. So it's nothing Earth-like, but you can see that there are uh, measurements on different parts of the spectrum. It's a very robust spectrum. So let me now introduce to you the actual um, detected super-Earths. <coughs> Excuse me. So in a in a diagram where I show radius versus mass, they plot over here, and I've color-coded them corresponding to temperature. So you have Uranus and Neptune here for reference. Earth would be something around here. And you see that they are larger, and they have a quite a distribution in radius. So you can ask yourself first which one of these can be rocky, and for that you use an internal structure code that gives you a relationship between mass and radius uh, according to composition. So something like Earth would lie over here, and exact versions of Earth with the same composition, but but larger, meaning more mass, would actually um, lie progressively on this line. Um, because rocky compositions actually don't have to be like Earth, they can be more enriched in iron or less enriched in iron, there's this spread. Of course, they can be very different in components like calcium and aluminum and, and other minor elements. Uh, but the one that has the most effect on internal structure is actually the amount of iron. So that's what I've plotted here. Uh, the other curves of something like a pure iron planet, which we don't think it exists, uh, to something like Mercury, which is enriched by about six times if you consider the iron to silicate ratio with respect to Earth. And the, the very, the very, uh, limiting case where you have no iron whatsoever. You remove all the iron from the core, you remove all the iron from the mantle, and you have this silicate rock. Even though, again, we don't think that that exists, it tells you the boundary by, um, that separates the planets that necessarily have to have volatiles from the ones that can be rocky. But even though the ones that can be rocky, and we've seen, we have a few of these, and these are two very interesting ones that have very similar compositions to Mercury, they are, they're not like Earth. So maybe this, the most similar one is this Kepler 20b. So, um, even though we're getting to the point of eventually discovering an Earth-like planet, 
they are different and, and, and it motivates also exploring parameter space when you're looking at, for example, processes like mantle convection. So, at least the ones that we've discovered, and that's because we're biased to the planets that are close in, they are much hotter. And much hotter, I mean, for example, Coro 7b has a temperature on the day side um, that is 2,000 Kelvin and on the night side of about 100 Kelvin. And why do I call it day set and night set? Because they're so close to their star, this one planet has a period of less than one day, that we think they're tidally locked. Basically, they're synchronized like the moon and the earth, so that there's one permanent uh, uh, hemisphere that's facing the sun, and so that one is the one that is the permanent daylight and, and very hot, and most likely um, has a, a partially magma, partial magma ocean there. Um, so... Now that I've told you that these planets exist, that they were discovering that as data arise, we expect to have something more like Earth, uh, I want to talk now about the interior dynamics and why should we care about modeling uh, mantle convection in these planets. And already Paul alluded to that, and it's because it sets, um, it, it has many effects on, on uh, things that we can hopefully detect. For example, the atmosphere. There's a strong connection between the atmosphere of these planets and what has happened throughout the evolution uh, of the mantle. Because planets evolve habitable conditions, and even though this is a broad uh, statement that we all agree on, we don't exactly know what is a habitable condition. What, For example, the magnetic field, is it really essential, or is it something that we would like to have but not uh, not necessary? So... Now, I'm going to focus on the ones that are rocky because there will be planets that are, that could be called super Earths because of the, the, the mass range, but they would be something more like Ganymede and Europa and the icy satellites. So if we just focus on the ones that are rocky, we can assume that they have a similar evolution to Earth, at least in qualitative terms, and that they accreted hot, they went through a magma ocean period, and then they cooled um, presumably maybe from the bottom up or from the mid-mantle up, depending on uh, the, the, the composition of the planet and where the solid is intersects the, the adiabat. And at some point when this, this, this is a very quick period because viscosity is so low that the planet loses heat very fast, so it solidifies, at which point it forms the first crust, the first plate, and it can go plate tectonics or perhaps stagnant lid. And as we saw, again from Paul's talk, alluding to um, Norman Sleep uh, paper in 2000, you can have this episodic transition. At some point, though, in history, when the planet has lost uh, enough heat, it would not be able to power uh, plate tectonics, so it would go into a static lid regime. So, um, so why do we? So one question that we can ask is if plate tec can, can plate tectonics be a viable mode of heat transport on super-Earths. And another reason why this is an interesting uh, question, not just because it's a mathematically valid question, is because on Earth we think that it has enabled the carbon silicate cycle to operate over billions of years, which is the cycle that has regulated the temperature on the Earth around that of liquid water. And we saw that... Um, I think we saw that yesterday. The temperature has 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 swung, but it hasn't been to the point of the extremes that I've already discussed with you. Even though, for example, the the sun was 70% um, dimmer in the past. So th one of the explanations is that this carbon silicate cycle has regulated the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, which has been at least on Earth um, been enabled by this plate tectonics that recycles material, sequesters material, etc. But it's, it's worth asking if this is the only mechanism that can regulate temperature, uh, or for example, episodic foundering can, can uh, do that too. So, I'm gonna go through this scaling loss in a, in a, in a simple, uh, way to show qualitatively, uh, what is happening in the, in the interior of, of massive Earth analogs. So to, to solve the, the problem, you actually have to solve the Navier-Stokes equations that govern the, the, um, the behavior of the fluid. And you can do this either by a numerical approach, which we've heard about, 
or you can use the parameterized convection as a way of simplifying the problem and only getting to qualitative uh, results. So this is what I'm going to focus on. So in this parameterized convection, you look at the fluid as being governed by this parameter that's the Rayleigh number. If the system is actually heated from below, you define the Rayleigh number according to the difference in temperature. If the if the fluid is heated from within, you define it as a, either the radioactive heat sources content or a heat flux. So in the study that I did in 2007, we prefer to, to parameterize this at the heat flux. And so the Rayleigh number is expressed in this following way. So it depends on the density, on the gravity, on the expansivity, thermal expansivity of the planet, on the uh, thickness of the mantle, uh, as I said, the heat flux, uh, viscosity, thermal diffusivity, and thermal conductivity. The, the ones, the quantities that I've color-coded in red are the ones that I definitely think we cannot um, disentangle from uh, a scaling of mass. Basically, when you look at planets that are more massive than Earth, you should not think of them as having the same density because compression will have an effect, therefore density will increase. So will gravity, so would the thickness of the mantle, etc. Of course, it, something will happen to the um, thermal expansion as well, but the, but the effect presumably will be smaller than something, for example, uh, like viscosity. So once you've defined your Rayleigh number, all the other parameters actually depend on this, on this, um, on this non-dimensionalist number. Um, and you can obtain, as I said, qualitatively how they behave. So in this case, you, you get the, this is the delta is the thickness of the boundary layer, which in the case of the plate tectonics is actually the thickness of the plate. Uh, or you can look at the stresses underneath the plate, the stresses that are happening in the, in the bulk of the, of the mantle. So, uh, what I did if, first was, uh, use an internal structure code, uh, that ob obtains the, as I said, the structure of the different planets given a composition that I put in and obtain all the different quantities that I need for the Rayleigh number and all the different scalings. And what I find is that compared to Earth, the benchmark is Earth, the plate thickness becomes thinner and the stresses in the mantle become larger. So just from qualitative, from that qualitative point of view, a thinner plate is easier to subduct, especially when you have a driving force that is larger. So we, uh, we concluded that plate tectonics is actually more likely on super-Earth than on Earth. And what we find also is that the temperature pressure structure of the plate doesn't change very much. We didn't know if the temperature, for example, of these planets that are larger, the, the, the potential temperature of the mantle would get much hotter. But in fact, it increases very slightly. Most like, because of this regulating effect that Paul, uh, described. On the same, same month, actually, there was a, a different study based on numerical models by Lenardic, O'Neill and Lenardic, where they, they scaled this code by, um, Solomitov and Moresi that was designed to, to create plate tectonics on Earth. And they scale it to planets that are larger than Earth according to the size. And what you see here is red is upwellings, blue is downwellings, and you can see that in the case of the Earth, you have spreading centers, so you have plate tectonics. But as you increase the, the, the radius, you go quickly into an episodic regime, and only with a 10% increase in size, you already are in a stagnant regime. So they, they concluded here in this diagram that for planets that are larger than Earth, you're in stagnant lid. For planets that are smaller than Earth, you're in mobile lid. That seemed to me very puzzling, since that would suggest that something like Mars would have plate tectonics. Um, they, uh, they suggest that what's happening is that the faults are actually getting stronger. The faults, which is where the formation can happen, subduction can happen, are getting stronger due to gravity, so they're locking the system. Um, so we did an, an, an analysis about that exactly. And say, okay, well, how is it that, that, that we can model plate tectonics and, and, and this is the standard procedure? And if you look at the plate, you look at, the condition is that the plate has to subduct. So you look at, at the, at, at the force balance on the plate and say, okay, the stress on the, on the, on the fault has to be larger than some yield stress. And, um, 
how do you describe this yield stress? So one, one way of describing this yield stress is this Coulomb failure criteria, which is very simple, especially when I hear the talks that, that we heard yesterday. I, I definitely see a, a, a shortcoming here because the way to model it is that is to, to, to make an analogy. It effectively comes to an analogy of a sliding block. Basically, one plate has to slide past the other with some sort of coefficient of friction that has to be overcome. So the Byerly criteria tells you that the rocks would yield with some cohesion coefficient times um, times a coefficient of friction and some dependent on on um, hydrostatic um, force. So you can you can and this is what this is what numerical uh, codes do. You you can define an effective coefficient of friction that takes into account the effect of water. If water increases pore pressure, so it, in a way it acts to lubricate the fault. So you can do this simply. That's one way of doing it. Another way is you can look at this paper by Foley et al., where they look at, they model subduction, looking at damage reality, and see how faults heal or continue deformation depending on temperature. But from that, you can say, you can look at the how the yield stress depends, and from the parameterized convection scheme that I told you, you can look at how the stress underneath the plate um, scales also with mass. And when you do that, you actually find that that scaling does not depend very much on mass. The strength, the the stress available from convection underneath the plate divided by the yield stress depends on something that is very weakly dependent on mass, which is possibly the difference in, in temperature. But really what, is, what, what, what I said was that what's important is this, is this ratio of what's actually happening on the fault. So when you do this stress balance taking into account that it's a tensor, you, what you find is that the, this, the stress on the fault gets, am, the, the stress underneath the plate gets amplified by a geometrical factor to give you the stress on the fault. And this geometrical factor will increase with planets that have higher Rayleigh numbers. Because planets that have higher Rayleigh numbers would have um, boundary layers that become thinner and thinner. So this will act to focalize the stress available from convection to overcome um, the, the yield, the, the strength of the fault. So other scalings, uh, according to different prescriptions for, uh, for the, um, for the Byerly criteria, can be can be found in this paper by Takley and his former student. So um, now that we can do this force balance on the actual fault, <laughs> given the structure code that I told you, where I can get how thick the plate is, what the stress is, how the how thick the mantle is, etc. What I found is yes, that the faults do get stronger. This yield at which the faults uh, would would start deforming do get stronger as you increase in mass because of gravity, but the actual shear stress on the fault increases even more. Um, as I said, this is benchmark on the Earth uh, so that it only serves as a qualitative result. Since then, there's been other, um, other voices in the community that have um, looked at the problem as well in different ways. So another numerical study by Kornaga um, came up with a criteria for plate tectonics based on that internal uh, Rayleigh number. So what they find, what he finds uh, is that for planets that are, that have a Rayleigh number that's large enough, you would have plate tectonics. Plate tectonics is anything be below this line, and anything above this line is stagnant. And so the way, the way that he looks at the problem is that he looks at the, um, uh, the difference in viscosity between a lithosphere that's very viscous and the mantle underneath. So when this viscosity contrast is very large, you have statin lid, but if you have high enough Rayleigh numbers, you will actually induce plate tectonics. And what he finds is, yes, you do have planets, so f these are um, planets of larger masses, you do have, it is more, it is easier compared to Earth for a larger planet to have plate tectonics, but actually the most important effect is having a low coefficient of friction. 
So anything above the zero line here has starting lid, anything below is plate tectonics and he can only get it with a coefficient of 0 0.03, which is actually something that other codes have looked at it, have, have obtained the same, but you don't get that from rock experiments. You don't get that low coefficient of friction. So we need a way to bridge our understanding of how things deform on a centimeter scale and how things deform in a kilometer scale because we're definitely missing some physics there. Um, another study that seemed to uh, point towards the same direction is that is this by Van Heck and Tackley where they look at this numerical model and look at four cases. Either the system is heated from below or the system is heated from within and two different prescriptions for deformation. And what they find is that it looks like planets are equally likely Planets that are more massive are at least equally likely to Earth to have plate tectonics. But once you include the effect of compression on the density, then you become, it becomes more likely. So it seems to be more growing consensus, but everything that I've shown you before is for mantles that are isoviscous. And these, pla these mantles are actually not isoviscous because pressure in these planets are ver is very large. So in this diagram where I show you the temperature versus pressure, you see this gr green line here, the profile for the Earth, that reaches about one megabar at, um, at the core mantle boundary. But for a 10 Earth mass planet, you reach about 10 times that. So, um, so as Paul said, the pressure actually increases more or less linearly with mass, which means that if you look at the... In a very simple case, if you look at a, uh, so this viscosity, uh, will change as the exponential of some activation energy divided by, by the temperature. And, it, if, and this activation energy depends on an activation volume. If you look at a simple case where the activation volume is constant and you put some numbers, the viscosity of these planets can increase by an order of a magnitude of 30. So 30 means it's probably going to be very rigid. It's probably not going to, um, flow at all. But what happens is also that the temperature, as, as, as Paul described, decreases the, the, the effect so that the, the overall effect is, um, is that this planet actually can flow. So I'll show you, I'll show you that. And so, um, and, and this relates to, to the results that, that Paul, uh, showed already and is that if this, if this activation volume decreases with pressure as we expect in a way proposed by um, Aman that does um, uh, ab initio calculations, uh, you can obtain um, for different from different simulations what the behavior is and what you find is that for planets of different masses you can get plate tectonics. However, the flow is different and in this case for example you see that the flow here in the lower mantle seems much more coherent uh, you have these large scale features. And the study, uh, also points out to the effect, maybe the, the, um, the importance, thank you, the importance of primordial chemical isolated layers, because if you have, if you start with a magma ocean, um, that is also basal, uh, then it might be preserved in this sort of planets more easily than it would be on a smaller planet. So actually, in summary, I just want to leave you with the thought that planets evolve habitable conditions. So if we want to understand habitab habitability in our planet and others, we need to understand how uh, rocky planets uh, evolve and especially their interior dynamics. The atmosphere is tied to the interior, so we should expect diversity, but we need to create that framework to interpret the data that's coming in the next few years. And plate tectonics, I would say, is still under debate. There are many things to 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 still figure out, like for example, the role of water, um, the role of surface temperature, the this debate about uh, exactly what the rheology would be at this sort of pressures and temperatures, which actually is not accessible from experiments, so we rely on ab initio calculations. Uh, but hopefully, hopefully this will get better with time and the interest of the community. So with that, I'll take any questions.